want to start by saying thank you again, all of you, for being here this evening. Um, we've got a great night planned for you. And before we get started, I just want to draw your attention to the screens around the room. We'll be putting a few slides up there. Also on the table in front of you, um, we've got these event response cards. We also have another card with a QR code. Take one of these. We really appreciate your feedback on the event response cards. It helps us know how we can improve. It also lets us know the best way to contact you after tonight. So fill one of these out. And then with the QR code cards, we are doing a raffle this evening. So if you subscribe to our Sanger Family Office YouTube page, you'll be entered into a raffle. All we need from you is just a screenshot. You can send it directly to Julia. We got um, the text number down there. We've got the email, everything you need. Send her the screenshot, show her that you subscribed, and then we'll, your name will be entered for a raffle. So we got some great prizes. For example, we've got uh, one of our books up here. We'll give away a few copies. It's the sixth edition of Stocks for the Long Run, which Professor Jeremy Siegel and co-author Jeremy Schwartz, who is our guest tonight, um, they wrote this book and it's just a great resource. We love the book and we'll be giving away a few of those as well as some other prizes. So it's very important. Send us that screenshot and your name will be entered. We are producing weekly content for you all, which is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, at Stanger Family Office. We are constantly working to bring you high quality research and insights on the economy and the markets. One of the best and easiest ways that you can access this research is by subscribing to Nick's Weekly Insights email. You'll Once you've subscribed, you'll also have access to his Nick Stanger show, as you can see up there. Uh, he's got great content that he gives out to everyone. And um, you can also listen to our other podcast, which is Bullish, where you can hear amazing speakers like what we have here tonight and stay up to date on earnings insights and specific economic events. So if you are not yet signed up, write on this event response card towards the middle, just check subscribe and you'll be able to start receiving Nick's weekly insights email. You'll also gain access to his podcast, The Nick Stanger Show. Nick provides us just with excellent commentary on the economy and the markets every single week and it's gonna be delivered right into your inbox. It is also a great way to stay up to date on our events. So um, just as you know, this evening, we've got our Wealth Insights Forum. So welcome, everyone. Again, it's a great opportunity. We love hosting events just to meet our team. It's a great opportunity just to hear from us and for us to engage with you. We host it every year. We got in Oak Brook, we've got Houston, we got Baton Rouge. So a number of these events and our most anticipated event of the year, though, is in November. I already spoke with someone tonight about this. It's our two-day annual event. It's our Investor Day. And it will be this year, 2020, for our 2025 season, it will be in Hotel Indigo, right in Naperville. And we will be covering all of the hard work and due diligence that goes into our rebalance process. So it's a great event. We'll also be joined by some outstanding guests. So we look forward to that. Hope you will be able to make it. I also just want to bring your attention to this. For those of you who are clients, bring them to events. You can also give them one of these starter kits. So we have these starter kits available for um, you this evening. And if you are a client, excuse me, if you're a client and you know some, someone who might need a little more clarity, might need a little more confidence in their financial life, please give them one of our kits. Um, it's an excellent resource. We'd be happy to have a conversation with them. If you are not yet a client, we would also love to give you one of these starter kits and um, we can just start the conversation from there, meet you where you're at and if you are ready to take the next step as well, 
since 1981, we have been doing these starter accounts. And with as little as $1,000, you can get started with our team. You will have access to our critical thinking applied directly to your portfolio. And we've been doing this for 43 years, right, Nick? 43 years, starter accounts. And that's just how we've been able to build trust with you all over the years. So um, happy to give you a starter kit. And if you're ready, do a starter account. So we got a few things here for you. If you listened to the Nick Stanger show, then you will be familiar with a few of th these things that I will be talking about in a minute. Our team has been making calls over the years about the market, about the economy, and just know that none of these calls came from that crystal ball that we have up here. So all of these calls have been made from the due diligence that we have, the excellent research, and it's just a reflection of what our team has done. So while I highlight some of these past calls here in a minute, I'd like to welcome to the stage, Nick, we've got Jeremy, and we've got Sam and we will be doing a live recording of Bullish this evening. So we're super excited for that. Uh, often times, oh yeah, put your hands together. We got a great evening here. All right, well, we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 16 of Bullish. So excited to have you here. We really appreciate you joining us. You know, Stanger Family Office, for the past 43 years, it has been our mission to deliver both clarity and confidence to help secure your financial future. Nick introduced everyone earlier. We got the whole crew here. Uh, we're unbelievably excited to have you with us. I'm Sam Hardy, as always. We got Nick Stanger. Joined by Jeremy Schwartz as well of Wisdom Tree. Nick will do an official introduction in a minute, but just need to say uh, anything we discuss is not stock advice. Excuse me. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Stanger Family Office and its clients may hold positions in some of the stocks discussed. For a full disclosure, visit StangerFamilyOffice.com. Nicholas. All right, Sam. Welcome away. back, buddy. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, different Jeremy. You might have seen the other Jeremy, Jeremy Siegel at one point. Different Jeremy this time. We've got Jeremy Schwartz co-wrote Stocks for the Long Run, the sixth edition with Dr. Siegel. You were a star student at Wharton. Is that correct? I mean, I feel like this is a special, as I heard your introduction, starting in 1981. I was born in 1981. Episode 16. Episode 16 is, 16 is my lucky number. Okay. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show. You're the Global Chief Investment Officer of Wisdom Tree. You've been there for a long time now, right out of college. So yeah, I started with Siegel. We were doing the third edition of this book, Stocks for the Long Run. It came out in 2002. Um, I started with him the summer of 2001. We've been working together for 23 years. I uh, basically never left. It's supposed to just be a semester abroad, a few months project, but I helped him on his second book, The Future for Investors, uh, that came out in 2005. And we joined Wisdom Tree in 2004. So we've been at Wisdom Tree for, for 20 years. Awesome. Well, we were talking a little bit before the show, too, before we got up here about how Wisdom Tree was instrumental in some of those calls we made, including inflation, which we're going to get to, including inflation not being transitory. And uh, so so everybody in this room has Wisdom Tree to thank for a lot of what went into that due diligence process the past couple of years. So one of the things I want to talk about, because we're uh, sitting here on a podcast and and uh, and which which is a new form of media is just highlight. If you go back to 1950, Jeremy, I don't know if you know this, but there were only 2,144 radio stations in the country. No podcast, not a single podcast, all radio. And today we have 3.28 million podcasts in this uh, in uh, in the globe. Okay, so huge explosion on podcasts. More and more people getting content out. Look at the difference with TV and YouTube channels. We're at uh, three in, in 1950, three options to pick from. And for better or for worse, there are 114 million YouTube channels out there. Look at the number of devices. Now, there were zero devices in 1950 that we know about connected to the internet. But in the year 2000, we had 200 million. Today, we have 15 billion. You guys at Wisdom Tree have been on the cutting edge of technology. 
maybe give give us all a couple insights into where tech is going. I know we've talked a little bit about tech adoption rates as well. All right. So when we first started talking to, when I first started working with Professor Siegel back in 2000, he made a big name March of 2000, wrote an op-ed, big cap tech stocks are a sucker's bet. It was March 14th of 2000. It was like basically the day NASDAQ peaked. And we say, a lot of people say like, where are you today in 99, 2000 for a lot of these AI stocks? And our look at valuations say the tech sector as a whole, if you look at just the S&P 500, tech sector includes things like Apple and Microsoft, but also Amazon, which is technically a consumer stock, and Meta and Google, which are technically communication stocks now by these, these index providers. That's 40% of the index today, which is a big component of the SP 500. That basket is selling around 30 times earnings today. Back in 2000, it was selling at 60 times earnings. So much more expensive, twice as expensive. Uh, we talk about Cisco versus NVIDIA. People might remember Cisco in the heydays of the internet, the inf yep. the backbone of the internet. Now NVIDIA is the backbone of the AI. And we make some analogies saying, if NVIDIA was selling at Cisco's multiple in the in the top, you might be a three or $4,000 stock in NVIDIA. But there is some research on NVIDIA. You've got one of the things I did here, uh, and we can talk a bit more about that. Yeah, so walk us through this chart. This goes through some of the high-valued stocks on a PE basis, I think is what you're looking at here, or price to sales. And it looks like the companies that are trading at a 40 times price to sales, meaning whatever your revenue is times 40, doesn't turn out to be the best investment all the time. It's it's very interesting. So NVIDIA got the distinction of being the highest multiple stock in the S&P 500 roughly a year ago. Last March, it became the highest price to sales that's market cap versus how much sales does it generate at the end of March. And we did this study going back the last 60, 70 years, you found there's about a hundred stocks that got to that level. It being the glorified highest priced stock in the market. And interestingly, one of the pieces of research we did saying, well, actually over the next 12 months, they tend to keep doing well. The momentum keeps powering them higher. Once they become the highest multiple stock, they keep going. And so that one year forward get you to be right about right now. And on average, those hundred stocks did beat the market over the next 12 months, but the odds of success from there on become much harder. So this study looked at all these high multiple stocks from 25 to 40 times price to sales. And as you go five, 10 years out, it becomes like 90% of them fail. You know, so it could be the type of stock that, you know, the one in 10 stocks that does win. But once you get to these very high expectations, everybody sees the success NVIDIA is having and everybody's going to come after them. Everybody's seeing what they're doing with AI chips. Apple's going to try to make their own the big companies are going to try to make their own versions. Google has been investing a lot in making their own AI chips. So everybody's coming after them. And it's just a matter of time in some ways before the high multiples catch up to them. So I want to go back to this chart on NVIDIA's annual revenue. And I think you guys put out another one on NVIDIA's profit as well. Same numbers here through the roof, profit growth, through the roof, revenue growth. Do people ever say, wait a second, Jeremy, I know we had a bubble in 1999 in the tech bubble. Is there a chance that the companies today are structurally different where they genuinely are real businesses compared to the pets.coms of the late 90s? Yeah, there's a lot of weird valuation multiples in 99, 2000 going to those internet stocks. It is definitely a very different number today um, in terms of the profitability. I mentioned that the overall tech sector is only half the PE multiple as it was in 2000. So that's a big statement to us. Uh, the earnings the interest rates are also much, much in a way lower today, even though the rates are higher than where they were just two years ago, the tips yield, we look at the tips yield as an inflation adjusted bond yield. It's about 2% today. Back in 2000, it was 4%. Okay. 4% plus inflation protection. The S and P was selling at 30 times earnings, which is like a 3% earnings yield. You were doing better in tips than you were doing in, the S and P 500. So it's a different environment there. And these companies are having real earnings. And, and so it's definitely a different dynamic today. When Dr. Siegel was first writing uh, stocks for the long run, I think it was early two thousands. Is that correct? His first edition came out in 1994. Wow. I did the third edition, which came out in 2002. That was my first project with him. And I think right when that book came out, then you had the tech crisis 
And a lot of people gave him a lot of crap, quite frankly, for saying stocks for the long run. You know, people called him the father of the bull market. So from the 90s, he was cheerleading the market higher. And he thinks, hey, 75 percent of the time the stocks go up, you know, so it's right to be a bull. When you, if you, one of my colleagues was I've been traveling with talks about if, if you could have a batting average of 75 percent, you go up to the plate and you, you're right, 75 percent of the time, you'd be a pretty good batter. Uh, and to know you're right to be bullish most of the time. Now, Siegel does try to call it like he sees it. He called the tech bubble. He's been calling for times when he gets a little bit more cautious uh, and, you know, he called out the Fed on a lot of different things. And so he does call it when he thinks things are elevated, um, but it is right to be bullish most of the time. Yeah, Jeremy, you guys did a podcast with this guy here, Dan Ives. If you're not aware of Dan Ives, he's very eccentric. He likes to wear the pink jackets with the flower shirts. So he's a big time analyst at Wedbush. He covered tech stocks in the 90s. And so he, he not only talks from a place of research, but really experience. You had him on your own podcast not too long ago. He says we're in this early part of a tech cycle, kind of like we were in 1995, where we're not in a bubble yet, maybe, but we could approach that level. Maybe walk us through what that 1995 moment means. Yeah, the big question we try to address on this Behind the Market show all the time is where in that tech cycle are we? And Siegel often says, are we in 96, 97? You know, are you, the other people who are more bearish will say you're 98, 99, maybe 2000. Dan Ives says, no, you're a step earlier. You're in 95 at the beginning of this technology starting to get diffused throughout the economy. And I think that's right from the tech perspective, from where is AI meaningful to all of us? You're starting to see it come. Um, you know, certainly the big companies are investing in NVIDIA chips to power the, their, their superpowers. You're starting to see companies like Microsoft start to bring it out. Chat GBT has been the thing that put on everybody's radar. All of our, I know my kids are even experimenting with it. I'm using it at work to help write different things. The coders on our team. I'm sure it's very useful. It's very useful. Did you write stocks for the long run with Chat GBT? We did not have Chat GBT for stocks for long run. No, we didn't have it. But the, I am using it to help summarize conversations, transcribe things, improve it. We are using it for things like that. But the applications are still so early. You know, now I think, an example where you saw it meaningfully is Meta, which was one of the pre, one of the best performing stocks the last few years. I think they had what they called their year of efficiency, which was they let go of 25% of their workforce. They shrunk their headcount 25%, but their revenues were up 25%. And so their profits soared. They've been one of the best performing stocks and all that news. Uh, and the whole story behind that is it's not like a chat GBT front end of thing, but they're using AI to figure out where to place their ads. You know, they used to do a lot of advertising through the phone, got a lot of data from Apple. Apple shut off a fire hose of information to them. So their revenues were going down from all their ads, but AI helped them get it back. And so you're starting to see companies use it. I think there's going to be a lot more productivity. I think Google is going to get to use a lot of this. They have a lot of people selling ads. The algorithms are going to do it better. And so there's a lot of interesting places that I think is going to usher in more productivity growth, better economic growth it's behind our interest rates call. But it's early, I think, in the tech diffusion. So did the stock market get saved by AI technically bailing out company earnings? Was it layoffs? Was it a rotation back to energy stocks that kind of bolstered earnings and that breath whining brought in and out in the market? Or do you think that we're due for maybe a little bit of an earnings recession here? Well, the economy keeps chugging along. So, you know, I, it is interesting, the diversion between, say, large cap earnings and small cap earnings. So you've had, you hear all the time, the Magnificent Seven, these large cap stocks driving the market higher. And it's real that their earnings growth are the really where the, the best earnings growth in the market are from these seven stocks. The small caps have not seen as much earnings growth. Now they're priced very cheaply. Now, the question will be, if the economy hasn't been, if it's stronger than expected, will that flow into broader earnings beyond the Magnificent Seven? Because they are really leading the growth higher. Um, and so it's been true for those companies, but you got to see the earnings broaden out, but the, but the other stocks are much cheaper. Is there a world where you have to distinguish between cheap for a reason, which could be a value trap, which I think some stocks could be in, some sectors could be in right now, or cheap, and it really is a good opportunity. How do you guys kind of screen that out? I'd say that's been one of the big things we've even moved ourselves forward at Wisdom Tree. You know, when I first started working for Siegel, 
he was going through that aftermath of the first tech bubble and he was his, his own portfolio would say, hey, tech is super expensive. I'm telling people tech is a sucker's bet. I've got to start buying value stocks. And so all the all of our research started going around value and he was focusing on high dividends, low P.E. type sorts of the market, which has now been a tough place to be. But a little over a decade ago, we started focusing on quality growth measures. And you know, one of the things Siegel had said to me when we first started writing The Future of Foreign Investors was go read everything Warren Buffett has ever written. It was the first exercise was read every shareholder letter, read all the books about Buffett. And so we even have a cover of on The Future for Investors, a quote from Warren Buffett on the cover is that the two then became friends during the internet bubble where they both were calling out tech stocks. Buffett was made fun of for not buying the tech stocks, but him and Siegel both took hate mail for, for being you know anti-tech back then. But Buffett moved from being what was like a Ben Graham value investor buying cheap stocks on a price to book distressed type stocks. People that they, he, Buffett started calling them cigar butts. You get the last puff of a, 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 a tip of a cigar. You get one or two last puffs before the companies die. He went from that to buying what he called high quality businesses. And in this latest shareholder letter, he gave Charlie Munger, his his longtime partner, the credit of being the architect of Berkshire, because Munger started saying, you need to buy high quality businesses at fair prices. Well, what is a high quality business? American Express, he bought in 1994. A few billion dollars, was getting $75 million of dividends. Now he's getting hundreds of millions of dollars of those dividends every year because they grow their dividends year after year after year. Coca-Cola, very similar time. High quality business, high profitable business. And when they talk about quality, they really mean high returns on capital with no debt. They don't want leverage driving the return on equity. So it's basically high profits versus equity. And uh, so we started building that into screens. And so even so our, our, our sort of leading strategies now have this profitability and growth screen, but still anchor back to dividends. You know, I think that's the key philosophy of how we've tried to avoid a lot of those value traps. Yeah, I think I think with the dividend call that you guys made, the screens you put on, that's got to be one of your top two calls. The other one of the top two has been not calling inflation transitory. And you and Siegel were on the cutting edge of that. Now, I'm going to play a video from Dr. Siegel in a second, but we do have a little uh, gift for you, I think we could call it. Um, Sam's going to bring it up here. We have the most expensive meal in the room for you. This is a Five Guys burger and fries and a milkshake. Um, I would not recommend eating. It's been sitting out for a little bit now, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to eat five guys anymore after looking at it right now, okay. but uh, we do. We're going to ask you, how much do you think this meal cost? $27. It's pretty accurate. Um, with <laughs> Honestly, it was 33 after we, you know, we gave him a little bit of a tip. Um, so 33. yeah, it was, if, if you did a 20% tip for, you know, whatever reason, maybe it was like 37. It was, yeah, it's pretty outrageous. Yeah, so forget the Gibson steak and salmon. We've got the five guys right here. Yeah. You guys were on top of that call. I'm going to play this video from Siegel. One of the quotes that he said, I think it was a month ago, a couple weeks ago, was he said that giving the Fed or giving Jerome Powell the Nobel Peace Prize would be like giving an award to a drunk driver who hit somebody and then was able to take them to the hospital and save their life. So with that, we'll play Siegel's last video on. He's been a little critical of the Fed. <laughs> Mark, uh, money supply data, which is going to show the greatest decline in five months that we've had in the post-war period. I mean, if he looks at any of the monetary or financial indicators, he can't say, oh, we have to keep them on. I mean, at his press conference, he said, we have to get real rates in the positive territory. They're in positive territory for every maturity. For the first time, so in the, think, we're already there. Um, I mean, I, so, I did. I thought that was the most uninformative. Uh, I mean, and and no one was asking him the, the, the hard question: How do we have three point two million new workers and GDP going down? What 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 is what does that mean? What does the record decline in the money supply mean? I mean, what is what does the collapse in commodity prices mean? What is the lag construction of of the of these housing indicators that are 40% of the core inflation, which you know, are, 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 going to, are going to filter through inflation for the next 12 to 15 months. 
Is that what he's looking at? Why is he looking at that? Um, that's not an accurate view of what in housing inflation is. I mean, I, w w there were no hard questions. They, you know, there, there were 50 reporters there. I don't know. They basically said, uh, you know, repeat the statement you made at the beginning. There's so many things I ask him. What is he actually looking at? I mean, he's looking at three month annualized core inflation that is a lag. Well, we all look at market. I mean, look at what does the stock market do? It looks at market oriented data. And that's what Professor, the Fed should be looking at. I don't know that I've seen you this animated. You seem down. I am very upset. At yes, I am. I am. I, I, I'm I. afraid it's like a pendulum. They were way too easy, as I've told you and many others through 2020, 2021. And now, oh, my God, you know, we're going to be real tough guys until we crush the economy. I mean, that that is just to me absolutely um, poor monetary policy would be an understatement. I'll let you respond to that. Well, com coming back to why well, when you hear him bash the reporters, I then reached out, you know, they do have this, this press conference where the reporters come in and I am a press, I'm a member of the press, I think. I, I'm on Sirius XM channel 132. We do a weekly show uh, behind the markets. And I said, hey, can I get a press badge so I could come ask some questions? And they said, you're not a full-time member of the press. So <laughs> I didn't I didn't get to go do the press conference questions, but we would have asked some tough questions. But the, you know, that goes back to when we, I said, you know, 75% of the time he's bullish. That was a time he was a little cautious. And the cautiousness came from actually still thinking the Fed is making a mistake. Interestingly, you haven't seen it have a material impact on unemployment. We we were expecting some of the inversion of the yield curve. We don't want the yield curve to be as inverted as you have short-term rates at five and a half. The 10-year today is 100 basis points higher than it was there. But you know, it's still not 90 basis points inverted. That is usually not a good positive indicator. The money supply, which Siegel is really pissed that the Fed lost sight of the money supply. He went, Siegel studied under Milton Friedman. He, his first four years, he got his PhD at MIT. He went to Chicago here to study with Milton Friedman in his first four years of teaching. And Friedman taught him everything about the money supply and you not day one of the money supply growth. But if you have an explosion in money, inflation tends to come 12 to 18 months later. And so Siegel early on from 20, like four months into the pandemic was saying, you're going to have a big inflation problem. And then continued saying all throughout 2020, 2021, spot on. Fed saying, nope. And uh, you guys, you guys picked up on that transitory theme very nicely as well. It So, but now, there's some questions. Money supply is shrinking. The, the rental is a key number that we're also miffed on them. But he was cautious, He thinking that the Fed was being way too restrictive. And, and so far, they're getting a little lucky. Yeah, this metric up here, I, I think you guys at Wisdom Tree, and this is how you got ahead of that transitory call, which was so important because people have lost so much money on long-term bonds here. It's, it's turned into real dollars. Is you almost started putting together your own metric and that blue line, if you can see it on the screen there, is really your tracked version of inflation that would have showed the Fed that they should have hiked rates a lot sooner, I think, but then also that they should have cut rates a lot sooner as well than they than they are. Yeah, we so uh oh. <laughs> but we we so we did put the BLS shelter is the official numbers you get from core CPI. They produce a core and a headline. Core takes out energy and food prices. We started doing our own measure because BLS shelter is so lagged. Uh, and what you see is the real-time data was happening in the real world. Home prices, apartments were zooming up, but the BLS number wasn't reflecting it. So we were saying, you're going to have much more of an inflation problem than you're saying. He was informed by the money supply, but then the shelter gave one of those real-time indicators. Now it's much lower. So the real-time data for apartment lists are negative. If you look at Zillow and an apartment list together, the average is about 1%. When BLS is 5.7%, 
So if you plugged in our real-time number instead of 3.8% core, which is way above the 2% Fed number, our number is 1.8%, so right on target for the Fed. So you're saying, hey, they actually are achieving their mandate at below 2%. Right. Jeremy, I think one of the things also that you guys figured out was that housing was such a big deal. We've got a lot of clients where their kids, their grandkids are looking in the housing market. They're trying to buy a house. They've been looking for three or four years and they're trying to figure out what's the next move. Do I stay where I'm at? Do I keep renting? Is there any hope you can give people on the housing market? Because that seems to be, it's a third of CPI. So what, what are people looking at the next couple of years? Well, the Case-Shiller Index, there was a time it was declining. The Case-Shiller Index is the home price index. Um, you know, it, it's hard to say is it symbolic what's happening recently uh, because so few transactions are happening. People are paying cash. If you don't have the cash, you can't afford the house. So the first-time buyers have been really out of luck um, because mortgage rates have skyrocketed. The house prices have skyrocketed. Coming back to that money supply thing where we talked about Money supply was up 40%. Home prices were up almost exactly 40%, like the money supply from before the pandemic to you know, two years into the pandemic. So there is some relationship between money supply and all that. But the, you know, there is a decade of demographic dividends for home demand. And so it's hard to see the demand softening. You see the the trend for millennials needing housing continue to be there. Now, the question is, is the supply of housing keeping up? And they, there's talks of multifamily, a lot of new apartments coming online. So maybe the rental market is going to soften. But in terms of it's the, the, how, the housing prices have been somewhat surprisingly robust given the 7% plus mortgages. But I think a lot of people think they're going to refinance lower. And then there, a lot of people are paying in cash. And so I think that's what's going on in, in, in the current market. Well, and a lot of our clients, I think a lot of us in this room here, um, you guys have done such a good job of paying down debt. If you've talked to us recently, so pay down debt, build up cash reserves. And so a lot of people across the rest of the country have done the same thing where they're maybe in the baby boomer stage, they're in the retirement stage, they paid down their debt, they're not financing, they're not going and buying a, a new car with debt, they're not going to go buy a new vacation home with debt. So they're not really affected by rates, not to mention they're sitting on maybe a stockpile of cash. So when the Fed cuts, is it going to almost feel like like tightening? Well, it's fascinating. You think about the people who are lucky to refinance at the 3% or longer. And now all their cash is earning 5 plus and just no, no risk, 5% treasuries, 5.5% you get in floating rate treasuries versus a lot of people, my mortgage is sub 3 Right. So you there's a lot of people who did that. And so mortgage rates in general, are, the current mortgage are ticking higher, but the aggregate stock of mortgages has barely changed because it's so few people taking out new mortgages. So in general, people have been much better off. Now, you could say usually you think of coming down of interest rates as supporting home prices. It could be that mortgage rates start to come down and all of a sudden new supply comes on the market. And it's sort of the exact opposite of what you normally expect of down mortgages, higher home prices, but more supply comes on because people feel like they can move and buy a new house. Yeah. It seems like the the politicians on both sides, and we've talked about this. I mean, it, the money printing started, uh, I think it was 2020 when COVID hit. So we had a red president. Now we have a blue president. The money print, printing's continued under both sides. And I do blame the Fed for being a little bit late, like I think you guys have, have said, and you know, not cutting soon enough. But how how much can you really blame the Fed when you have both sides of the political aisle just pouring gas on the fire? No, no, you you, you do have to blame the Fed. And the way <laughs> so, so you're you're a fan of Jerome Powell as well, is what you <laughs> Well, you know, you get indoctrinated by the weekly conversation with the professor. But yeah, the there is a difference. So it, there was a there was a lot of calls while the Fed was buying all these bonds in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, and the people thought that there was an explosion of money back then, and it was going to lead to all this inflation. But what happened in the 2008 financial crisis never diffused into the real economy. It didn't go into people's checking accounts. It was just excess reserves on bank balance sheets that never got lent out into the real economy. What happened in the pandemic, the government was doing all these pandemic relief measures. Who knew we shut down the economy? They had to do something. Okay. But where the Fed went wrong 
is if the government had to issue the bonds to the market and they had to finance the purchases, rates would have naturally gone up. But instead, the Fed bought every single bond the government issued. That was the issue. So rates were able to stay much lower. The Fed financed all the spending by the government, and they didn't have to do that. So that was that was the issue. That's what's caused, you know, if they had to be forced to the market and pay the real market rate, interest rates would have gone up, they wouldn't have done as much. But because the Fed financed it all, money supply explodes, rates stay much lower, and that's where the Fed got it wrong. And Japan has run these massive deficits for years. They haven't had the same inflation. Is that what you would say the difference is then? Well, if everybody, you know, if I if you get one of what are the risks out there for the economy today, the debt is definitely one of the key questions. It, can we maintain this 34 trillion debt and can we pay it off? And Japan is actually a, at an interesting part of you could say the projects of of all these governments who have big debt and then the Bank of Japan bought basically all the bonds. They have some of the lowest interest rates in the world. They just went out of negative interest rate territory in the last few weeks. Their 10-year bond is still below 1%, even though they have some of the highest debt-to-GDP ratios in the world, a few hundred percent debt-to-GDP. We talk about the challenges we have here in the U.S. Now, you could say they didn't really have a problem except that the currency just now, I mean, for a while, the currency was so surprisingly strong, despite all the Bank of Japan purchases. Well, now the currency has been weakening to like 155. 10 years ago, it was around 75. So if you need a place to vacation, definitely suggest Japan, the sushi. Great. Your, your dollars will go much further in Japan right now. But, you know, the... What, what would get the governments here serious about getting debt under control? The UK is a pretty interesting case study. A few years ago, the UK had a crisis in the pension market. Their pensions have all these inflation-adjusted bonds. They had a prime minister trust come out. She was trying to cut taxes, and the market freaked out about the finances that they were going to do, and yield spiked. And all these pensions looked like they were going to blow up. And two weeks later, she's fired. And basically, they had to get a new prime minister, and they had to take a new policy, and it wasn't sustainable. And so the the we have all these entitlements. Nobody's going to touch them until the bond market freaks out. If the te if the ten year went from four fifty to six fifty, they're going to get serious. But if the bond market just does moves around nicely, they're not going to do anything. Now, Jeremy, when we were walking over here, you did pull me aside. You said, "Nick, I actually secretly love bonds." Um, but let's just say you really like stocks. Make the case: stocks for the long run, six editions. We've tried to make the case and keep people in the stock market. Um, what's your case? What's Dr. Siegel's case for the stock market long term? Well, inflation is definitely top of mind. Inflation is the key risk to bonds. You know, you're getting a fixed coupon that doesn't grow. And so, you know, today the 10 years at 460, if you're worried there is going to be out of control inflation, it's going to erode the value of that 460. You could buy the S&P 500. It has a Dividend yield a little bit under 2%. It's got a PE ratio of 20 times earnings, which means the earnings yield of the S&P is around 5%. 5% earnings yield is what we think of as the real return for the market. So you add inflation on top of that real return. So if you think there's going to be 2 to 3% inflation, you'll get 7 to 8% for stocks. And the real return in bonds is, is more like 2%. You know, the TIPS bond today is just above two. Five versus two. You know, why is why is, do we look at these earnings yield as real returns? Companies raise prices along. What When you see the biggest themes you see is you talked about the five guys price. Their costs of potatoes are going up. Their cheese costs are going up. What are they doing? They're raising their prices. They pass along. Companies pass along their input cost price increases to us. And so consumers pay higher prices, and you you find over time, the earnings and dividends grow with inflation. And over the burger time. meat does have gold flakes in it. I just want to point that out. It's not the Chicago cut here. The Chicago cut here has also had a lot of inflation, as we tested to uh, last night. <laughs> so Jeremy, let's wrap up with a couple. You had a great tweet here. You were talking about Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, who passed recently, and you were talking about the bank failures of twenty twenty three. 
do you see some issues with the regional still? Are there any concerns that you have? Obviously, JP Morgan, if rates keep going up, they stay up, may be the last man standing here. But do you see more problems ahead in the banking world? This, this would be a good little exercise. Um, how many people here have a bank account paying zero interest on their checking account? That's too much. That is too much. You should not be doing that. <laughs> and so it's surprising. I, it, it, everybody, everybody does. And the banks are getting this cheap funding by us consumers who leave. We, you know, we want to go to money market funds. You can get 5% plus with no risk. Government money market funds paying 5%. There's going to be more technologies. We know because we're working on them at Wisdom Tree. Personally, you're going to be able to do pay your bills off of funds paying you 5%. It shouldn't be earning zero. I mean, that is such an improvement. So I think now the banks are banking on people being lazy and not wanting to pay their automatic bill pay. And, you know, but it's a digital world. You get the ACH and routing number and move it pretty quickly. And so, you know, I do think the banks have this long-term funding issue. I think their cost of funding should go much higher. There's trillions and trillions of dollars. You're not alone. Everybody has these bank accounts paying nothing. But the challenges are that you have, you know, you had the Silicon Valley banking crisis. Money moved in a dime when people had lost confidence in that bank. But the real underlying problem is that the banks are paying zero when you could be earning five. That has not gone away. If anything, has got worse. So... The banks, the small banks in particular, I think, have still have their share of challenges. One of the things that you guys point out in Stocks for the Long Run is buying real companies with real earnings, with good balance sheets that actually make sense. And not that Salesforce doesn't make sense. That's uh, the ticker on the screen, CRM, Salesforce, which is the, uh, it's a CRM company. And I think in a large way, they're trying to become a big, big data player and some of the other things. But in 2020, Salesforce replaced Exxon Mobil in the Dow as one of the stocks. And we've seen the, the difference in ExxonMobil stock price here the past few years. ExxonMobil's up 203%, the Dow's up 45%, and Salesforce is only up 5%. Why did this happen? How did this happen? And, and is that something that you, you think is gonna continue? And is this a unique event? You know, they, they it, and they, you can sort of poke fun at the major index providers like the Dow, you know, it's been around since 1896. They only, they only own 30 stocks, but, this was a classic example of, you know, they're humans. It's a committee picking these 30 stocks or the S&P 500 is 500 stocks. Interesting, a lot of people don't think of it as just an index, but there's actually a committee of people sitting around the table picking what stocks go into it. And it's done pretty well. It's been tough to beat the S&P 500. Uh, most active managers fail. Like the vast majority fail. Yet they succumb to some of these biases of what, what they add has been what's hot. So, you know, one of the central studies that was the, Back, you know, the infrastructure for that Future for Investors book I talked about, 2005, was a study we did, Siegel and I did, on the original S&P 500 stocks in 1957. You would have held like 20% in energy, which is now just 3% of the S&P. You would have had all these dying materials companies. That was 20% back then and a few percent now. You would have had no health care practically, no financials, no tech, which is today 50% of the market. And we say, well, how much would you have lagged the market to hold all these quote unquote dying sectors? When we did the book, you beat the market. And it was a case for value investing in some ways that what happens all the time is the S&P doesn't add any energy stocks. 1980s oil is booming. They add 30 different energy stocks and they go on to underperform. They don't add any communication stocks. In the 90s, telecoms booming with the internet. They had all these telecom stocks. They go on to underperform. Here is the classic example. Um, Energy had a rough decade. Looks like it's out of favor. What's in favor? Tech databases. They add CRM and Exxon goes on to crush it. They, same story with Tesla when Tesla was added to the S&P 500. What more exciting stock than Elon Musk and Tesla? They sell an apartment REIT, which looked like it was going out of business. And then Tesla goes on to dramatically underperform. The apartment REIT goes on to dramatically outperform. And it's actually consistent. I just did a blog of all the changes over the last five years. You take all the ads, all the deletes to the S&P 500, all the companies that got added, the new exciting companies underperformed the market by 5%. All the companies that got dropped, they've been in the toilet. They've been underperforming. Well, they, they sell them at the bottom 
and then they go on to outperform by 15%. So it's, it's a fascinating dynamic. So it's not just a one-off. It is a little systematic, yet it's still very tough to beat these indexes. Jeremy, let's wrap up here with a couple of quick hits. You guys have pointed out the outperformance in the U.S. versus international. I may disagree with you just a little. I'll just say I might just I've been very heavy U.S. We've encouraged our clients to own no China, which I think you'd agree on. That's the next slide. But is there really a case to be made in Europe? Is there a case to be made in Japan when you have a lot of the population trends working against you and they just don't seem to have the innovation we have here in the U.S.? I'd be very selective on what you want to own. I agree that China is a very, very difficult place to be, um, and it might look like a cheap opportunity. Stocks are selling at low multiples, but it's a very tough place to invest. The, the geopolitical situation makes it almost um, really in, uh, uninvestable, although it's sometimes when oil went negative was the right time. People say, you can't invest in energy. So when you hear those words, often you do want to invest. Now, you, you had Buffett on the screen a few minutes ago. Buffett's big investment is in the U.S., but very interestingly, very, very interesting, the last three years he's been buying Japan. Japan is the third largest economy. It's the second largest exposure in most market indexes. And so Buffett's buying Japan. He's doing it in a way where he's issuing bonds in yen. So he's financing the purchases so he doesn't take currency risk. That's a big part of what he talks about. I say that's a big part of the story. So you got to think about, do you want to buy the euro? Do you want to buy the yen? Or do you want to buy a strong dollar? I think the strong dollar is much more favorable to portfolios. But I like Japan. If you actually put me and say S&P 500 or Japan for the next decade, I might pick Japan the way that Wisdom Tree does it. Because we start with 4 to 5% carry. You get paid these interest rates because we have higher interest rates in the U.S. versus Japan. They're a much cheaper market, seven PE points lower. They've got a lot of good things happening. Buffett's a good influence on their corporate governance. So don't leave out Japan, but um, you know Europe, I'd understand. China, I definitely understand. India is also a place for long-term innovation and growth. A billion people took over the world's largest population, the world's largest democracy, some of the most cutting edge technologies, they could open a bank account with their fingerprints and everybody has a bank account. So it is it is one of the best growth stories for the next 30 years. It's basically where China was 20 to 30 years ago. So I do like India. It's been one of the only emerging markets to have double digit returns over the last 10 years. Broad emerging markets, 2%, India, 10%. Japan's one of the few places that's outperformed the US over the last 10 years. So there are a few select places, but I understand the case for not broadly. Okay, um, let's talk Bitcoin and then we're gonna wrap up. We have not invested in Bitcoin. We don't have any plans to, but a lot of people have been saying, Nick, what is Bitcoin? Should I be looking at this? What's going on with it? Is it a real thing? Jamie Dimon, I was out there on CNBC yesterday calling it uh, the biggest scam of all time. I don't know if that's correct, but just explain Bitcoin in its most basic level and, uh, and, and your thoughts there. Another question for the audience. Does anybody here old gold? Got a few hands, maybe five, six, seven, eight hands. Gold, I... We make an analogy that this is this generation's gold, sort of the young generation's gold. Um, you know, the, the narrative is very similar. So you, wh why has gold got this store value? Well, it has for 5,000 years. People use it as a currency. When we show in stocks for the long run, one of the central charts shows the last 200 years, gold kept up with inflation. It did a little more on top of inflation. It did about, what, about 60 basis points a year over 200 years. Um, which was a little bit better than inflation. And part of the, the idea is that there's a fixed supply of gold. It's hard to get new gold unless maybe a mine strikes earth and brings a lot of gold from outer space. Who knows? But the Bitcoin, there's like 21 million Bitcoins. They don't create a lot more of them. It's sort of like the what people on the internet like to use and speculate on. Can it go to zero? Of course, all these new things can uh, find things that disrupt why it's being used. But there is a community, I think somewhat like the gold people who like really like gold. I own both. I own gold and Bitcoin. And I think it's just this younger generation's gold is how I think of it. So Jeremy, we're going to wrap up on here. We always like to on bullish, do a little bit of a meme of the week, which if you don't know what a meme is, it's a picture. And then there's somebody who puts a little <laughs> caption under it. 
And uh, this was from the Babylon Bee, if you're familiar. The White House announces inflation is doing really well if you hold the chart upside down. True. True. <laughs> I agree. Okay. There you have it. Yeah. So Great thank point. you so much for being on, Jeremy. Fun. Thank you so much.